Amen. Amen. I'm going to read from the gospel according to John, the 15th chapter. Now, I am um, I'm not preaching to a house full of, of ministers. I, this is not a conference somewhere. I realize where I'm at. I'm preaching to a good group of wonderful saints. Underline that word saints. That's a heavy-duty word in Scripture. And it means the holy ones. And your faithfulness that he spoke of, your support, your energies, and your willingness to follow what is cast forth as a vision. It has... It has brought about all of this. You work your jobs, you conduct your homes and your families in a godly way. And I know where you are. I love the pastor and I love those people in Lake Charles. And so I'm just going to preach something tonight that I felt that I should bring to you. And God never misses it. Now, Rick Treese may miss it and does miss it at times. But God never misses it. Timing is everything. And so I don't know who you are. Really, I don't. I know what, I, I know what just a couple of you do for a living, and that's, a, that's all. I don't know about your families. I, I don't know any of that. So I'm just free to preach. And if I happen to walk across your front yard, while I'm behind this podium using scripture you just take it that God is certainly got his face toward you and that means his favor that's what that means I'm going to read from John chapter 15 I am the vine I am the vine, the true, is how the Greek text reads. I am the vine, the true. It is translated as the true vine. But it has significant meaning and has more meaning if you do divide the words as should be. I am the vine, the true, as it is written. And my father is the husband. Every branch in me, every branch, Kalema, every branch in me not bearing fruit, he takes it. And every one branch is inserted, and every branch that bears not fruit. Or that bears fruit. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes it. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it. Kathire, which we get the word to cleanse, catharsis. Every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it will that it will bring forth more fruit. You may be seated. I really don't feel that I will preach long, but I have something to very direct that I'd like to say. And I want to preach on this subject this evening. It was some... It was some couple of months ago in that closet of prayer that is a must for us all. And feeling my way through, I had this scripture come to me and this question that I will preach on. And I just kept it as, as your pastor knows that he does. A message come. They come. The messages come in different ways. And timing is everything. 
Just because you feel it that, that it came to you it doesn't mean that's the time to preach it. Timing is everything. And so I brought it to our congregation in Lake Charles just a handful of weeks, a couple of months ago. And I really, I really feel that I should preach this question. What's happening to me? What's happening to me? It is a most striking statement that Jesus made to his disciples. He was not wasting words. He was not just trying to wax eloquent and impress them. But he was preparing them for the most difficult and demanding race or work that ever they would embrace. These men, these young men, they were all younger men. They were not a group of elders. They were, they were reaching forward into the prime of life. And some were fishermen. And some, if you will, had other abilities of, of um, working in public. But all of them had one thing in common. And that is, since they had met this Jesus, this young rabbi from Nazareth, once they had met him, everything in their life had changed. And they were willing, because of his, his words, because of his spirit, and just because he was exciting to be with, they left what they had, everything they had, and they said, we're just going to follow you. And so Jesus was talking to men that he was going to hand his work to. It was towards the end of his public ministry. The Gospel of John records three Passovers, thus the three years plus of public ministry. Is noted. It was during Passover time, and it was at the end the disciples had been with Jesus in the upper room. And Jesus, in that closed setting with his disciples, had disclosed some things about the Spirit of God about himself, his messiahship, and the future. He disclosed some things in that setting that he had not told them. Notice that after the betrayer had been sent out, only then were there some things disclosed. As long as the betrayer was in their midst. He did not tell some things. And so when you begin, there is a gap between the 14th and the 15th chapter of the book of John. At the end of chapter 14, Jesus said, Arise, let us go from here. It is most, it is most believed that that was spoken in that upper room setting. And where did they go from there? We know that ultimately he went, later on in these verses, he entered into the garden, thus Gethsemane. And we know what was going to happen just in a few hours. Where were these words spoken? I am the vine, the true. The true vine. Where were these words spoken? There are two possibilities. Either one of them are fine for us to take. The doors of the temple were open during that Passover period. 
because there were pilgrims from miles in all directions that gathered. It was one of the three gatherings in Jerusalem per year that every male had to appear before the Lord, etc. And there were many, many pilgrims that had traveled to Jerusalem, to the temple, to be a part of the Passover demands. The doors were open day and night for these activities and all of these participants to be able to enter and take care of, of what scriptural demands were there and, 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 and were about. On the doors of that great temple, were the emblems, or it was the emblem of the nation of Israel itself. The beautiful emblem of a vine, symbolizing the nation of Israel. And so as they left the upper room, and they were headed and going in route to the garden. Not just possible, very probable. Instead of just speaking it out on the street somewhere. As they pass through the temple and that great emblem on that door, that entrance of the temple, and there were more than one there was more than one way to get into the facility. with them seeing those doors and that vine emblem on it, he designated that spot for a great lesson that he did not want them to forget. And he said, I am the vine, the true, the true vine. The vine in the Old Testament Where is it? Psalms chapter 80. That declares that Israel is a vine. That is to produce. In that Psalms 80. It is declared that if Israel or the vine does not produce. Then God will do to it whatever it needs. So that it will produce. Israel the chosen, the woman Israel, as is depicted midways of the book of Revelation, had already produced the man-child, Jesus. Israel had not recognized and had not responded in faith to that man-child that they had produced. And so it was, it was up to the work of the husbandman, which is the father. That there was some work that yet needed to be done. So that the fruit that must be produced, and it was ordained that it would be produced, would come forth. And so Israel being a vine. Jesus declared, I am the true, the vine, the true one. Israel is the vine, but right now they're missing it. I am the vine, the true one. Not is they're missing it. He said, every branch that does not produce fruit... God takes it. We insert the way the word takes it away. The word is he just takes it, meaning he takes it out. If, here is option number two. If they were not standing in sight of those great temple doors with the vine, the golden vine on it. Then they had already moved out across Kidron. Into the garden. And there in that outer perimeter. Of the city towards the garden. That they would. That they would pray in. Those that would pray. 
there were, in that garden, there were vines growing. And it was very common in that day, during that time of year, for small fires to be built. Why? Because those that tended the garden, those that tended vineyards, it was pruning season. And they would trim and cut away branches that were of no more use. And they just would pile them up and they would burn them there. And so within sight of the city, those small brush fires were visible. Jesus said, every branch that does not produce fruit, the husbandman, which is my father, he takes it. And all these little fires that you see burning out here around these, these garden perimeters, that's what that's all about. Things that have been already deemed as non-productive. And the husbandman does not suffer it to remain. But it's cut off, it's cast into the pile, and it's burned. But every branch that is bearing, if there is a branch that is bearing, a good branch, a good productive branch, he prunes it, not cuts it off and takes it out totally, but he prunes it so that it will bear more fruit. I've come tonight to preach this question and to answer somebody's secret question. Somewhere in your home, somewhere in your workplace, somewhere in your prayer time or wherever it has occurred. You have asked the question, what is going on? What is happening to me? I'm faithful. I'm doing the best that I have ever done in my life. I am more connected to the Holy Ghost than I have ever been. I've got a better prayer life than I've ever had in my life. I've given more at this point in my life than I have ever been able to bring myself to give. And now I am being cut back. I have had some unfortunate things come to me. Do I just classify it as that's life? No. God is sending you an answer this evening. Would you take it as the honored? Would you take it as God's badge of attention? And I'm not just trying to build you up in a pep rally. But I'm going to give you something that appears to be that's so opposite. That kind of reasoning is so opposite. Let me declare unto you that God's ways are not our ways and what we think is success and progress is not what God calls success and progress in its maximum sense. Let me tell you what you have experienced and what you are experiencing now calling a setback is a set up. What is happening to me? I'm finally to the point where I've learned to teach Bible studies. I finally learned how to meet people on the streets and talk about the one thing that matters most. I've finally come out of my shell. I'm preaching about people that have already gained fruit in your lifetime. You have already achieved bearing fruit. Would you take it as God's compliment to you? If you were not bearing fruit, he would just take you out. 
Every branch that doesn't bear fruit, he takes it. But if you're bearing fruit, then he prunes it so that it will bear more fruit. Let me tell you, God has sent you an answer this evening. And I'm not taking more on myself than I ought to. God knows you. I don't know you. He's the one that spoke the words. And he said, remember this, disciples, I am the vine, the true one. Israel has missed it. But I am here to make Israel to produce fruit. I am here to turn these things into the real. And notice that if you are producing a little bit, I know how to get you into a gear, a mode, a step, a rhythm. I know how to get you into a place where you have more vision, where you have more ability, where you can produce not just fruit, but more fruit than you ever have. I'm preaching to a church that has a lot of vision. There's not many churches that is able to succeed as you have, not just here in your local city. But you're able without the vision and and the voice of, of some outside office dictating to you what to do. Because you are a group that, that you thrive on vision. This is not flattery. Let me tell you the truth. You're able to produce vision through the Holy Ghost gift. And then able to carry it out. There's a lot of people that think a whole lot of thoughts. And I'm going to do this. And that's what we want to do. But it's another thing to roll up your sleeves and get out there and do it. Not just here. But in foreign countries that are, if you will, on the other side of the planet. And it is really happening there. What you're experiencing here, it's really happening there. You are producing fruit. Let me tell you, do not be disturbed. Do not be tripped up as saints. When you are producing fruit and you're doing the best you've ever done. For you to feel yourself as a family, as a married couple, as an individual, or as an entire church body. For a moment to be cut back to where you feel diminished. And it for a moment shocks you. And you wonder what in the world is happening to me. What is happening to us? God, haven't we given it our best? God, haven't we given everything that we possibly can? And here it feels unfair to me. Jesus had already given the direction. If you're not bearing fruit, I just take you out. But if you do bear fruit, then I know when and how to prune you so that you will produce more fruit. Let me tell you, we are just moments before the return of the Lord God Almighty to collect everything that has been gathered in the field of the harvest. We are only moments before that. But I with all of my heart feel, saints, listen to me. And I'm not using that word as a byword. I'm preaching to these saints. Hoy hagoy, the holy ones. Let me just give a little parenthesis here. I've made a practice, Bishop here. I've made a practice that when we have a memorial service in Lake Charles, and when you pastor in the south, it's, it's, an, it's, it's the Bible Belt. Our church in just a few more years will have been there a hundred years. I am only the third pastor in a hundred years. And we've got some elder gray-haired saints that's been in it all their lives. They've been faithful. Friend, they have given. They've supplied the message. They have built preachers. They grew this preacher up. uh, They're wonderful people. And so I have made it a point that when they are carried down that center aisle and they are laid, if you will, in state before the eyes of all that come to view and respect and memorialize, 
in front of all of politicians that come, in front of all the city officials, in front of the who's who that gathers. I make a big deal about saying and doing my hands this way. Behold a saint. A saint is not just somebody that they bury beneath the floor of a cathedral somewhere because 30 or 40 or 100 years after their life, they're voted on that they did enough good works to be deemed in sainthood. I explain and I go through the little take that to be a saint simply be means to be a holy one. And what we have as this dear man or this dear woman They have lived a life of purity and of power and they have produced fruit in this city and they have been clean and they are a saint. It's not some mystery. It's not some magical something that we use that it's, 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 it's more, it's more common than what we would say and we need to say it. Let me tell you the people of God that will respond to the trumpet call are the holy ones, the saints. If the church doesn't say it, and if the world doesn't recognize it now, then all the world will recognize it shortly. They may not know it where you work, but they're working next to a saint. Let me tell you, a saint is a person that puts on their shoes one at a time and they they wake up on a Monday morning and they're tired like everybody else and they've got chores to do and they got kids to raise and they got bills to pay and they got a church that they're responsible to and they got a pastor that they're willing and able to follow and they do it all with such wonderful grace and productivity. They're not superhuman. They're they're just regular folk, if you will, flesh. But they are pure, and they are the holy ones. They are saints. Let me tell you that mama that just pulled up into that school circle and let those two little beautiful cherubic faces out and gave them an encouraging word and pled the blood over them for that day. You may not see that mama's name up on a billboard anywhere in the city. And you'll never see that mama anywhere in a magazine. But let me tell you, that dear, that dear soul is a saint. She's a holy one. She does not miss it when the Holy Ghost comes on her to achieve something. She's a fruit producer. At what age can you become a saint? Do you have to be 32 before you become a saint? What is the requisite for a saint? Let me tell you in the schoolroom, seated at the desk next to you, that young person that refuses to be what the world is pressuring them to be, that walks and marches to the beat of a godly drum that will not be joined to the unfaithful and to the world that has decided that my life is about Jesus. It's not about self. My life is about Jesus. You don't know it, but that dear young person is listed among the saints that heaven recognizes every day when they leave their house. Ah, Let me bring honor to the saints. Heaven's looking down on you and it applauds your abilities. It applauds your success. And it has noticed your fruit. Heaven is not against you. God is not mad at you. Life has not gone backwards. God has not run out of blessings. God has not changed his mind about your future. God has not decided to whip you. What is happening? You may not understand it. But let me answer tonight. 
What's happening to you is heaven is so proud that you're a fruit bearer. Jesus said, if you're not bearing fruit, I just take you out. But if you are bearing fruit, I purge you. And the word that is used is the word that we get to cleanse. I, I, I bring you through a process. You feel shortened. You feel cut back. But when I get through with that, you're going to bear more fruit than you ever have. And so what you felt was a setback is heaven's set up. Oh, let me tell you. Brother Elder, you're right. This generation, according to Jewish journalists within the past 12 months, not apostolic, not American, not Christian journalists, but Israeli journalists have written that right now there is more persecution upon the Christian worldwide than there has ever been, including the first three centuries of Christianity. Now you think about that. When you read about, when you read about the first century after the crucifixion of Christ, the first century had the martyrdom of the apostles and the saints that were in not only Jerusalem, but in other countries and other areas. And then on in the second century, you had the Nero and the Domitian and all the crazies of, of, of world leaders, the empire. The devil was against that wonderful message of truth going forth and tried to stamp it out in every way that they could. Let me tell you, Paul said, when I was with you, did not I tell you that you would suffer tribulation? And that word is thalipsis, which is pressure. Thalipsis, which is tribulation, is more properly translated, if you will, in this case, pressure. Did I not tell you when I was with you that you would suffer pressure? The Israeli journalists say that right now in this year that we are living, there are more Christians being persecuted than ever in church history. God knows what he's doing. Are things out of control? God, why are you letting this happen? How come there's persecution that has come to us? Let me tell you, God is not out of step. God hasn't missed it. God's never early. God's never late. God's always right on time. He's never made a mistake with, with anybody or anybody's family. And he's not about to make a mistake with you, your wife, your job, your retirement. He's not making a mistake with you. Let me just say, I don't know if you've noticed it or not. But I finally, after we had done enough crusades in a number of countries through the years, when we started to do this Uganda thing 10 years ago, take on that orphanage, and I had some men of the church come to me and say, well, we, we want to be the team to go do it. I told them, I said, I want you to expect something. I want you to expect some weird things to start happening. If you take it on yourself and you decide to get on the front line and you decide to break through in a nation that has so much darkness in it and you're going to take it on to break that darkness, then you just expect there are going to be some weird things happen to you, to your family, and to your job. I said, I don't want to scare you. Don't be afraid. God's bigger than all that, but expect it. To this date, with the exception of one, 
And maybe if I just thought about it long enough, it may include that one also. But every one of them that had business for themselves, they were thriving. By the time they had made more than one excursion into revival into a foreign land, That business had been hit so hard that they're no longer in business. I don't know if you've experienced that. You say, well, is that God's will? Let me tell you, God's prosperity truth is there. You are going to bear fruit. And you are going to prosper. But you're going to do it under God's terms. All your rewards will not be here. But what is going to happen if you'll be true to him. Is that he will bring forth more fruit through you. If the devil shuts down this business. God will give you something else. If God shuts a door, he'll open a window. If the window is closed, he'll make a hole in the wall. And that's what's happening. And that is what has happened to every one of those men. Come sit in the office, Pastor, what in the world's happening to me? I went to Africa. We gave thousands. God's got a much bigger plan. I really could preach a great deal longer, but I'm not. I've just come to answer the question that somewhere either in your closet of prayer or you've sat at your supper table looking at your wife and your children and you've you've had the ledger book out and you've had the checkbook out and and you've had the, the doctors are poured out and you say, dear God, what's happening to us? And Jesus has answered it through his word. You've been a fruit bearer. I want you to stand up, not right now, but when that happens to you, I want you to stand up and I want you to square your shoulders and say, God, if you have, if you have allowed me to bear a little fruit, I don't know what you have to do with this frame here, but every inch and every fiber of what you see here, I gave to Jesus when I was just a kid. And whatever it takes... To get me to producing the maximum. I don't know how much Rick Treese can produce. But I do know that I've gotten off the phone not too long ago. And I had just done my best in some areas. You think, man, that was a slap. God in heaven. What's happening to me? I've preached for all these years. I've pastored for all these years. I've denied all the other things. that Some of the scandalous ministries in the world have pursued. Tried to be as clean as possible. You know what? I'm not going to get suckered in. To that false pursuit. Of this that life and God is not fair. Let me tell you what the devil wants you to do. Is to pick up a red hot coal. And try to find somebody or something to throw it at. Because you've done your best. And now you've been cut back. Let me tell you what you'll be doing. You'll be standing there a long time. Trying to find the right place to throw it. And you'll wind up only getting a burned hand. Somewhere you've got to admit. God this is all your work. My life is yours. It's your work. It's not mine. I'm going to do what you give me to do. I remember I took... You be seated just a moment. I appreciate you standing. That makes me feel good. I'm still like a kid preacher. I need all the help I can get. 
I told you this morning, I take my mama to eat lunch several times a week. My wife doesn't like to eat as early as I do. So I just call mom and say, Mom, let's go to lunch. It was during one of these times. I remember I was driving her car to lunch. I was getting out of the car. I said, Mom, I got about 10, 12, 15 more years if the Lord gives me that long. And I said, and when I'm done, somebody else can take it. It's just one of them times where you, I don't know if it was a Monday or not. Sometimes I've had Monday all week long. Mom, I've got a little while to go, and when I'm, when I'm out, I'm out of here. When he takes me, I'm out of here. I love what I do. But let me tell you what, that preacher is just as human as you are. Let me tell you what this family does. They pull what, what they have to pull in life like every family does, and then they pull the weight of the church The daily care of the church, they pull it too. But in all of this, it's easy in life while the process of continual pruning goes on. It's easy to get cynical. It's easy to get bitter. And it's easy to get insensitive. Lord, I've tried my best a number of times and I keep getting cut back. And the Lord says, yeah. Because you're a fruit bearer. And that's how it has to happen. That's okay. That's okay. Hmm. I remember, Brother Elder, and I'm closing here. I'm going to play the piano here when I get through. I want you to come play the organ or whatever. Play the bass or the drums or whatever you want. Play my guitar if you want to. I like this guy. Y'all got a great drummer, and this guy's got talent. Unbelievable. Yeah. Now, what was I going to say? Yeah. I was going to tell you about Dad. Brother Westbrook. Just before service, you whispered in my ear. I was there in that service at the general conference when your dad was preaching holiness and somebody was so angry they pulled the fire alarm to try to shut the service down. You were there. I was there. Let me tell you what happened after that service. Dad just kept on trying to preach. I walked up to him. I walked up to him while he was in the pulpit at general conference and I just spoke in his ear. I said, Dad, they can't hear you. Just stop. Perhaps they'll give you another chance to finish he said okay turn around and sit down when he walked out of the Colosseum he told me a while later a good while later he told me he said son I heard a voice it came to me it spoke to me and said you've delivered your message and from that point on his life started going down his health began to deteriorate And he lived in intense pain. And he'd get up and he he was so obsessed with the word. We used to hunt and fish together. We rode horses together. If it was fun, we did it. Man, we were buddies. We pastored together for years. He'd preach one service, I'd preach the next. He'd preach, I'd be on my feet. I'd be preaching. He'd be pushing worship. Man, we were a team. But all of a sudden, he was taken out of the team. And so he focused everything that he could just in that office writing. He had such intense pain. He'd call me. He'd call me over in the late hours of the night and say, Son, come over to the, come over to the house. And say, if you just rub my legs and if you just pray over me. He said, I'm hurting so bad. I'd go over. I'd live right next door. I'd, I'd go into his bedroom. Mom, mom would be there. And I'd start massaging his legs. And I'd, I'd be calling the name of Jesus. And I told him, I said, Daddy, you don't have to work anymore. Don't worry about it. I said, uh, I'm going to take care of you. Don't worry about it. You're going to be fine. He said, son, I, I, I want to preach. I want to preach. I know you want to, Dad. I know you do. But I said, you just do what you can. He'd go in that office every day. I'm talking about an intense pain. 
Uh, you know what? I, I have not lived in chronic pain. There may be some people here who every day you live in, in chronic pain. He told me one day, he said, Rick, he said, I'm, I, I would never take my life. He said, I'm not that kind of person. But he said, I've hurt long enough and intensely enough that I know why people take their lives. And he said, I know that every day, unless God does a miracle, every day I wake up, I'm going to hurt just that bad. And he did all he could writing. And so the Sunday before he passed, he was eat up with cancer. And I walked in after Sunday school and I sat down in that bedroom chair where dad was laying. He said, how was church? I said, it was good, dad. Oh, he said, I wish I could have been there. I looked at him, I said, dad, have you told me everything that you know? He said, yeah. And don't take that by any means that I know everything he did because I, I don't. I said, Dad, are you sure that you hadn't left one thing out? He said, no, son. I said, well, thank you. I got up and I walked out. Not knowing within the next three days that he would be promoted where there is no labor and there is no work and there is no more pruning. There is no more pruning. Let me tell you, there is, there is a point. When the Lord says, you've passed. And heaven smiles and says, come on up here. That is not a downgrade. <laughs> that means you have won. You have produced fruit and more fruit. And heaven says, you did it. You did it. You did it. He didn't know when the timing was. I didn't know when the timing was. It was two days later. <clears throat> doctor came in. Dad was in the hospital in Houston. The doctor came in. said, You're, you've got cancer all over you. But he said, I'm going to tell you what. You've got a friend. It's called pneumonia. Let's just see. We just level just like that. He said, you've got a friend. It's called pneumonia. You're not going to die of cancer. You're not going to die of cancer. I was sitting in a barber's chair while that was going on. My sister was in that hospital room. She called me. She said, Rick, said the doctor has, the doctor has just come in and given those words. I said, well, has anybody, has anybody ministered to dad? She said, no. I said, give him the phone. And I got up and walked out of that barber's chair and I told him, I said, dad, I know the doctor has just come in. But let me tell you something, Dad. If it doesn't dawn on you, the doctors just say, you're, you're fixing to get to go to heaven. Oh, yes, son. He said, I know. I said, how do you feel? Oh, he said, that's quite all right. <laughs> let me tell you, when you've borne enough fruit in the heat of the day, and then you've been pruned and cut back in life. And you got used to the routine to where you could do it and hurt a number 10 every day and still produce fruit. The scripture says he will not ever be threshing bread corn. That, that pruning does not go on eternally. Only until the good is done. God is not abusive. God is not a monster. God is not unfair. And the will of God is not a wild goose chase. And the will of God is not a shot in the dark. Dad, your doctor says you're, you're fixing to get to go to heaven. Boy, it was hard for me to say it. I tried to be strong. I felt my voice cracking. 
How many, how many kids get to tell your parents that? I tried to be strong for him. I made it. But when I heard him give that sharp report back, yes, yeah, son. What do you think about it, Dad? It's quite all right, he said. I knew he had won. Yeah. So what's happening to me? God has answered your question this evening. Don't get mad. Don't get bitter. Don't quit. I want you to take it as God's smile. That you've been a fruit producer. He's fixing to put you into a pace that you're producing more than you ever have. How's that? How is that? Is there anybody that can do that? God can only do it if you allow it to happen. How about that? By the time you get through with life, and I'm going to go to the piano after this, by the time you get through serving God, you will be used up.
you know Oh yeah Oh yeah Jesus Oh Jesus 